Hi folks, Dwayne Thomas here. Today we are going to have our first ever question and answer video for the channel. This is where I will answer questions that were sent to me by my Patreon subscribers and my Facebook friends. And this is your opportunity to ask me anything you want to ask me. Okay, let's get started. Kevin Bryant says, in your experience, not just personal, but observing other people, what is the most effective way to concealed carry a gun? I think if you want to see what works best, the easiest way to do that is to look at what the vast majority of people do, <clears throat> because the cream really does rise to the top. And what the vast majority of people do when they're concealed carrying a handgun is they have it in a holster on their belt on the strong side of their body. When you factor in everything, concealability, comfort, accessibility, um, the ability to get to the gun with one hand as opposed to having to you know, pull aside a concealing garment, that really is the way that works the best. Now, the only way in which I kind of differ from the norm on that is that I strongly prefer a three o'clock carry, a true strong side carry, as opposed to the more common, you know, 3.30 or four o'clock behind your hip carry. And that is primarily because it is a lot more comfortable when you're sitting in a car seat because the gun tends to lie along the side of your body. You're not literally sitting on the gun and jamming its gun butt up into your floating ribs. And it's also a lot more accessible because again, it's lying on your side. You're not literally sitting on the gun. So if you need to draw the gun when you're sitting in your car with you know a three o'clock carry, all you gotta do is reach down, draw the gun. It's pretty straightforward. I don't think it's necessary to go inside the waistband. Um, if you're wearing the gun under a short concealing garment, you know, like a short windbreaker, um, having the lower part of the gun inside the waistband could be an advantage. But if you can choose the garment that you're wearing and choose it to be long, you know, choose it with concealment in mind, it's not really necessary. And inside the waistband is definitely less comfortable. Also, it pretty much requires that you go behind the hip with the holster at an FBI tilt. Now, I will also mention that I don't particularly like FBI tilt. If you're going to go three o'clock, you're going to find that having the holster be straight drop where, you know, the muzzle is right above the end of the slide, you know, straight up and down, um, like so, is actually a lot more concealable. And also, you know, let's not kid ourselves, it gives a faster, more directional, you know, innately simpler draw than having to bend your wrist and, you know, go around your body and then, you know, come out in a big circle while you're straightening your wrist out, which you have to do if you're carrying the gun behind your hip with an FBI tilt holster. Now, I actually have had um, people that I have asked, you know, with my full-size 1911 carry gun, can you tell that I'm carrying the gun in and inside the, you know, and outside the waistband holster? Um, can you tell that I'm carrying the gun when I'm bent over? I mean, does it bulge at all? And the answer was no. 
I think that most people can carry and conceal with a good holster um, a much larger gun than they think they can. Um, I also think that most people who think that they can only carry a tiny little micro gun um, because, you know, the people around them are just checking them out and, you know, looking for the slightest bulge, seriously overestimate how much other people care about them and what they look like. <laughs> um, as far as other people are concerned, we might as well be invisible. Now, I will say that I am well aware that I am a self-employed freelance gun writer. I do not hang out with wimps, and I don't have a job where I could conceivably be fired if I were discovered carrying a gun. I'm my own boss, and frankly, that asshole would probably fire me if I didn't carry a gun. Now, if someone were to say to me, well, you know, I feel for my own use, you know, I have to go for a smaller gun, have to go inside the waistband, have to go AIWB, you know, whatever. Um, I would not say that those people are wrong. You know what works for you better than I do. So go for what works best for you. Okay, moving right along. Stephen Martin says, How did you get to where you are now from where you started, and why did you do that as opposed to something else? Well, you don't really specify what you mean there, but I am going to assume that you mean why am I a gun writer, and why do I do that as opposed to making my living some other way? Um, in order to answer that question, I have to tell you a little bit about me. I spent 10 years on active duty in the Army. I sold my first gun article when I was 25 years old in 1989, while I was still in the Army. And I sold gun articles for a few years, built up my markets, and then in 1992, I exited the Army and I've been making my living as a gun writer ever since. A few years ago, I passed the 1,000 articles written and sold mark and three books and more of all of that stuff to come, I promise you. Um, as to why I do this as opposed to anything else, it's because I love it. I, I love writing, I love shooting, I love learning about guns, I love learning how to shoot guns. Um, I cannot imagine any job that would suit me better than freelance, self-employed gun writer. And I would be absolutely miserable doing anything else. So it's not like I really have a big choice. <laughs> Okay, Malala Malala says, which would you prefer, great sights or trigger? Well, I think for a self-defense carry gun, there are certain things you absolutely need. Um, number one priority, the gun has to be reliable period. That is not negotiable. Other than that, you need sights you can see and a trigger you can control. And if you're going to shoot your best, you need a gun that fits your hand so the gun points naturally. So as far as the question of, you know, would you rather have great sights or great trigger? As far as I'm concerned, that is like saying, would you rather have a heart that pumps blood, or would you ha rather have lungs that breathe air? Um, the bottom line is you need both. <sighs> Having said that, um, I will answer your question. If I could only have one, 
it would be the great trigger. Um, I can make sites that are less than ideal work. Um, a lousy trigger impacts my shooting much more negatively. So if I had to choose between great sites or great trigger, I would choose great trigger. I would not be happy about having to make that choice, however. David Costas says, if you could only have one handgun on one single caliber, I assume you mean in one single caliber, what would it be? Well, I'm not going to answer that question. And it's not because I don't think it's a good question. It's because I'm currently planning to do a video called Five Favorite Carry Guns, in which I will answer that question. And I don't want to, you know, spoil the punchline in this Q&A video. Um, what I will say to answer that question is, honestly, I don't really think it matters that much. As gun nuts, we tend to get very wrapped around the axle about, you know, choice of you know, what gun is the best? You know, what, what handgun is the best carry gun? Um, you know, what cartridge should it be chambered with in? You know, whatever. And the truth is, when you're talking a good gun, it doesn't matter if it's a good 1911, a good Glock, a Beretta 92, a SIG, an HK, CZ75, you know, whatever. The capabilities of the guns are actually close enough that what gun you're carrying and what cartridge it is chambered for is not going to be the deciding criteria for whether you win your fight or not. It really does come down to how well can you use the gun. Now, I will also say that while I think it's very important to have a gun that you like because that's the gun you're going to practice with and that's the gun you're going to want to get better with, um, and although in general I don't think it matters, you know, the capabilities of good auto pistols today are so close, it's, it's a non-issue. Um, I will say you can make the performance of two guns so disparate that it actually does matter. And the first example that occurs to me is that one of my Facebook friends recently told me that he knows a guy who makes his daily carry and concealment gun a Colt Model 1851 36 caliber Navy cap and ball revolver. And it's not because that's the only gun he has or could afford. It's because that's the gun he likes. Now, while it might not make a difference to your survival, whether you have a, a 1911 or a Glock or, you know, whatever, um, the guy who carries a cap and ball revolver in the early 21st century is insane. I invite you to go out to a cowboy action match and watch anyone shooting one of these guns and see how often the cap, when the gun fires, disintegrates and little pieces of the cap fall down into the mechanism and they tie up the gun. And how often even great shooters, champion shooters, who have chosen to shoot that type of gun, spend pulling on the hammer and trying to turn the cylinder by hand to force the gun to work. It may not make a difference whether you're carrying you know, a 1911 or a Glock or a Beretta or a SIG or a whatever. Um, but when you've got a modern auto pistol and the other guy has a cap and ball revolver, in overwhelming probability, the guy with the cap and ball revolver is going to die. So 
although in general it doesn't matter, we can make the gap in capability between different guns so extreme that it actually does matter. Okay, Richard Ellis. How did you first become involved with combat, practical, action, pistol shooting? In Washington State, where I live, there is a format for indoor action pistol league shooting that has been around forever. It's shot on an indoor range. You shoot on one target um, at close range. The number of shots fired are such that you can do it with one box of ammo. And it's intended to be, you know, generally short range, very easy. Um, it's intended for beginners. And they do that for eight weeks. And then on the ninth week, they have a fun shoot and they have an award ceremony and, you know, everyone gets soda and pizza. And, you know, it's just a very low stress, fun thing. I actually did an article on this um, procedure, you know, the way that these matches worked for an article one time. And one of the questions that I asked anyone, you know, who might know was who originally came up with this system. And the truth is that no one knows. You know, the, the answer to that has been lost in time. This is just the way it's been forever. You know, the, this system is just a part of the communal knowledge in the shooting fraternity in Western Washington State. So that is how I got my start as a competitor, um, shooting little indoor local pistol range league stuff. Okay, Jerry LaPointe says, I'd like to know more about your dry firing practice. What drills you practice, how long you spend on each drill, and how often you train. Also, live fire same question but how many rounds in a training session thank you well you are welcome jerry um the truth is that as far as skills that you need to be a good shooter there really aren't that many things that you need to practice um, you need to be able to do a good fast draw, you need to be able to reload the gun, you know, either a slide lock reload or, you know, a speed load. Um, you need to be able to have excellent trigger control so that you can move the trigger really fast without causing the gun to move off target. And once you get to the point that you can do all that stuff, there's really not a lot more to practice in dry fire. Um, these days, when I dry fire, honestly, um, I usually do it while I'm talking on the phone with people. Um, I live in an apartment on the second floor of a three-story building where the ceiling and the floor are two foot thick poured concrete. There is nothing that I can fire out of a handgun that could possibly penetrate those barriers. So, you know, the floor and the ceiling are safe backstops. Um, there is no reason that I can't lie in bed while talking to someone on the phone and practice dry firing. Um, as a matter of fact, the, you know, people who know me, who talk to me on the phone, um, regularly have gotten so used to the sound of a gun dry firing, um, that they don't even notice it anymore. You know, for me, it's just normal. Um, I also have a theory that when you are distracted by something else, 
specifically talking to another person while dry firing and working on your trigger control, the movements will go into your subconscious and become an unconscious reaction faster and more certainly. Um, so how often do I dry fire? I dry fire every day. Um, I dry fire, you know, occasionally um, practicing things like draws, speed loads, slide lock reloads, um, left hand only, right hand only, shooting while moving. Um, there's a limit to how much of that you can do in an apartment, <laughs> but I practice what I can. Um, mostly what I do actually is just work on my trigger control and that normally mostly happens while I'm talking on the phone with people because I just look at that as dead time that I could be dry firing and no opportunity to dry fire should go unmolested. As far as live fire practice sessions, um, as time has gone by my practice sessions have actually gotten shorter. They used to be typically like 500 rounds for, per practice session. Um, my longest practice session was 1,500 rounds. <laughs> and uh, it took about eight hours. It was on an indoor range that was basically just one open area. It was about 60 feet square. And by the time I finished, um, literally you could not walk on that floor without walking on a shell casing except for this one little circular area where I was standing. But that was extreme. Um, typically it was about 500 rounds. Um, as time has gone by these days mm, 250, 300 and I have come up with a um, very specific set of drills that I do to measure how well I can shoot a particular gun. And I will go out and I will do that. Um, you do hit a point in your shooting where the, the practicing the basic stuff, it does kind of become boring. So what I will do a lot of times is I will just pick a particular drill that I think is fun and I will do that drill. You know, like uh, I will do, you know, the Ken Hackathorn, Larry Vickers, the test. Um, or, you know, I'll do the five by five drill or, you know, the one, two, three, four, five drill. You know, just, just all this stuff that is more interesting than just, you know, working on stuff I already know. Um, now, I will say also that while you're exercising the skills that you already have and doing fun stuff, um, don't forget to work on the stuff that you already know how to do because the truth is we can always be better. Alrighty, Nelson R. Cologne, Nemo, my old internet friend. Uh, he says, I know you have a high classification and have had good finishes in your local IDPA circuit. Do you compete in USPSA matches? If not, why? Um, the answer is I don't currently, I have in the past. Um, I actually started shooting IDPA in early 1997. I actually shot the first IDPA match that was ever held in Washington State at the Firearms Academy of Seattle in early 1997. Um, I started shooting USPSA in 1999, just after the United States, you know, split from IPSC and formed the United States Practical Shooting Association, USPSA. So technically, I have never actually shot an IPSC match. For me, it's always been USPSA. And for quite a while, I would say maybe until maybe 2005 or so, um, I shot IDP and USPSA. 
And I used to tell people um, at the time that I think I'm a better IDPA shooter, but I enjoy USPSA more. Um, there is something about, you know, the sort of semi-fast, very accurate, you know, put the bullets right where they need to go um, vibe in USPSA that works really well for the way my mind works. Um, having said that, in USPSA, let's not kid ourselves. Shooting fast is more fun. And where I finally lost interest in USPSA, um, I was about 2.3 percentage points away from Master and, um, you know, looking forward to getting the M, and, um, which eventually I would, but, you know, my M was in IDPA. Um, I started shooting IDPA and USPSA to get better with my carry gun and to work on my skill level with my defensive equipment. Now, early on in USPSA, I did get myself a Safari Land race rig. And that could be, you know, a topic for video all its own. But I think even if you're focused on doing it all with your carry gear, there is something to be said for doing a certain amount of work with a race rig because it is easier to draw faster. And it's kind of like training wheels for speeding up your draw. Um, once you can do a sub-second draw out of a race rig, it's almost like it gives your mind permission to do the same thing out of your carry gear. But in short order, I switched back to doing it all with my carry gear. And, you know, it, it was a bit of a pain, you know, when you are, um, you know, shooting a single stack 1911 or you're shooting a Glock in production, you know, where you have to download your magazines to 10 rounds. Um, you know, I, I wasn't able to do it with the two, you know, magazines I normally carry on my body, you know, in concealed carry. I had to put on, you know, a second um double mag pouch, you know, just to complete a stage. But I was able to justify that to myself because I said, you know, okay, that's just more practice reloading. Under stress, while moving. You know, great, wonderful. And then as time went by, what really lost um, me, my interest in the sport, was some of the props that started showing up. Um, when the Texas Star showed up, again, I was able to justify it. I said, yeah, okay, um, you have to shoot fast and accurately, you know, to clear Texas Star, and, you know, okay, I can see the relevance. Um, but when things like Polish plate racks started showing up, that was when I just, I hit my gag limit. I, I was just like, no, <laughs> this is silly. <laughs> If I want to shoot a carnival arcade game, I will go shoot a carnival arcade game. Um, having said that, you know, never say never. I'm not going to say that the day will never come that I'm shooting USPSA again. It is certainly possible. Okay, Richard Brenneman says, under normal range conditions, as opposed to extreme sand, dirt, mud, lack of maintenance, have you witnessed Glocks performing more reliably than other quality handguns? Um, before I answer that question, I, I just want to specify, I clean my Glocks every 10,000 rounds. Um, not because I'm a slob who doesn't respect machinery, but because most people don't know how their guns will operate or if they will operate when they're that dirty and they haven't been lubricated in a year. And I don't want to come across as all prepper because I'm not, but it is conceivable that one day I might have to operate a gun in an environment where I don't have access to cleaning supplies or lubricants. 
And most people don't know how well their gun will work or will their gun work in that environment because they've never done it. I have. And my Glocks just keep working. So when it comes to reliability under harsh conditions, you know, extreme use, lack of maintenance, Glocks are the gold standard. Period. End of story. Having said that, um, to answer your question, just in normal use, you know, it's a carry gun, it's a match gun, you can keep the gun, you know, reasonably clean and well lubricated. Have I seen any advantage in reliability in the Glock over, you know, other good guns? You know, a good 1911, a bread 92, a SIG, an HK, you know, uh, whatever. Um, no, I haven't. There are some guns that are commonly considered good that, in my experience, are notably unreliable. I've never seen a Springfield XD complete a match without having multiple malfunctions. I've never seen a car of any type complete a match without multiple malfunctions. I've rarely seen a Browning High Power complete a match without multiple malfunctions. Now, I will be the first to admit that may have a lot to do with the ammo that people were putting in the guns. Um, but if you are talking, you know, good guns, you know, first tier guns, that are reasonably clean, you know, reasonably well lubricated, no, no, they're not more uh, reliable than a Glock. The Glock's um, advantage of extreme reliability under extreme conditions, it's very desirable if you're operating in those extreme conditions, but the truth is the vast majority of us don't. Um, other guns that are less reliable in extreme conditions can work just fine if they're not being operated in those conditions. Okay, William Tracy asked, how big are the real differences between Stopping effectiveness of 9x19 and 45 ACP. What degree of overlap is there depending on the load? <laughs> 9x45, or rather 9 versus 45. Um, the eternal question. <sighs> I'm a really bad person to ask that question because I came to the conclusion long ago that all any of this stuff does is make holes. If you can shoot whatever gun you are armed with, you know, with whatever cartridge it is chambered for, if you can fire that gun fast and accurately and put multiple rounds where they need to go, it doesn't matter, within reason, um, what you're shooting. You know, 9, 40, 45, 380, you know, whatever. Um, if you can put the bullets where they need to go and you can put multiple rounds where they need to go in a short time frame, anything that you shoot will probably get the job done. And if you can't do that, anything you can shoot probably won't get the job done. Now, um, I will say, by the way, this next thing I'm going to say um, is not meant to insult your skill level. I, I know you, I know that you are a serious shooter, I know you're a good shooter. Um, having said that, I will say there are people in the world, not you, um, who tend to get really fixated on the equipment. You know, it has to be a particular gun, it has to be chambered for a particular cartridge, it has to be, you know, the perfect load. And Honestly, I don't think they're putting their time and attention where it needs to go. 
they need to be practicing. They need to be improving their skill level. If you can shoot fast and accurately and put the bullets where they need to go, what those bullets are in overwhelming probability is going to be completely unimportant. And lastly, Bernardo Del Carpio says, your glasses look very thick. I have noticed that myself. I wonder about your vision and how it influences your ability to shoot. Also, how you have them set up for shooting, i.e., do they allow you to focus up close on the front sight or downrange at the targets? I think that a lot of people make this whole glasses thing with shooting a lot more complicated than it really is. <laughs> And, you know, you'll see people trying to make bifocals work and, uh, you know, they'll have, you know, their master eye has a lens, you know, where the focal distance is set up for the front sight and then the other lens is set up for distance and, you know, they get massive headaches, you know, um, because, you know, like this eye is trying to do one thing and the other eye is trying to do the other. Um, I am very fortunate that I have an optometrist who is a shooter and you know he shoots rifles but still he has no problem with me bringing my gun into his office and I have told him I want you to set up the focal distance on my prescription for the front sight. Now what that means is, and by the way, I don't have um, specific shooting glasses. These are the glasses that I wear every day, you know, all day, um, you know, except when I'm sleeping and taking a shower. Uh, and, uh, you know, these are the glasses I wear while shooting. I, I don't have specific glasses that I only wear while shooting. That has never made sense to me. So, you know, people have said, well, you know, if you do that, you're not going to be able to focus on the targets. And my answer to that has always been, aren't we supposed to let the target blur and just have the front sight in sharp focus? I mean, if, if your prescription makes the targets blur slightly and the front sight is in sharp focus, I see that as an advantage. Um, now, I will also say, the last time I went to my optometrist, he told me, oh, you know, your eyesight is such that you actually fall between two prescriptions. You know, I can't get the prescription perfect for your eyes. You have a choice. It can either be a little weaker than it needs to be or a little stronger than it needs to be. And I said, well, you know, let's make it a little stronger than it needs to be. Um, you know, that, that will put off the, um, the time when I have to get new glasses, you know, because my eyes, you know, we age, you know, our eyes get progressively worse. Um, you know, may, maybe I won't have to do this, you know, for another three or four years instead of every two years, you know, whatever. Um, sort of the unintended consequence of that, and it was unintended, um, if I had figured this out, I would feel like a super genius, but it was, it was a total accident. Um, having eyes, um, having eyesight, you know, having a prescription that modifies my eyesight, um, and having the prescription be stronger than it actually needs to be, um, what I have found is that, you know, targets that are in close you know, are still a little blurry. Um, but the front sight is in focus. You know, if I'm looking at the front sight, you know, targets are blurry. But I have found is if I want to, I can look straight at the targets. And that 
goes out further than you would think. Um, one of the drills on the Firearms Academy of Seattle handgun master test um, is a long range drill, you know, 15 yards, you know. And um, one time when I was shooting this drill, they were actually using the Las Vegas Metro PD target, which is black lines on a white background. And what I found out was that at 15 yards with this prescription, not only can I see my bullet holes appear, um, I can see the lines on the target. So, to answer your question, um, my glasses, my corrected vision, work great <laughs> for shooting. Um, I am pretty happy about that. So, that is the end of the questions for our first ever question and answer video. I thank you to everyone who provided questions and I look forward to doing this again. You have a good one.